and welcome to Inside View. I am your host, Joel Metzger, and joining me on the program today is Dr. Ryan Thompson, who's a family practitioner in Murphy's and has been for a very long time. He's also the medical director at Mind Matters. Ryan, welcome. Hi. Really glad to have you on the show. Uh, you are my father-in-law. I'm, I'm really, really proud to call your daughter uh, my wife, Emily, and uh, it's been really fun to be part of the family for the last few years. And, and, uh, and it's okay. It's yes, okay. It's okay. Okay. Yes, you're a lucky guy to have my daughter. That's true. I think we've come a long way since when we first met. I think you had a, was it a shotgun or a pistol? Yeah, yeah, both. It was yeah, both. It was both. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we a worked lot of past that. Yeah. Worked past that. That's good. So uh, I know most people in the county know you well, um, and, and really, you know, many people are probably your patients, but for those who don't know you, I, I'd like to give a little background. So uh, let's go all the way back to where you grew up. I grew up in Santa Barbara, lived there for the first 12 years, and then moved up to Solvang, where I did my high school years. And uh, as, as a child in Santa Barbara, um, w were you ever kind of thinking, okay, I, I'm, I'm thinking I, I want to be a doctor, or, or was that something that, that came a little bit later in, in your life? I didn't have much direction as a kid. I don't know what I was going to do till I got to high school. In high school, I joined a group called Amigos de las Americas, which is a volunteer group that goes to Central America, South America. And the first time I did it was kind of on a, on a whim, just thinking I wanted to get out of Dodge, do something different. And then I got involved in doing that, and I discovered I really liked it. I really, I love the, the service of other people. I love learning about uh, health issues, that sort of a thing. So it was kind of a start then, but I wasn't convinced I was able to do it yet. What, what was kind of the, the mission of, of that group? What, what was their, their main goal? Uh, most of it's a public health type program. So most of it was immunizations or eyeglass distribution, dental health processes, uh, nutrition surveys, things like that. But you go out into small villages and small groups of volunteers and spend four to six weeks. And these really isolated villages, really a challenge really really exciting really as a young child as i mean as a as a high schooler uh not a lot of purpose in life and i felt that in high school and so it was a real challenge and it was real real work really rewarding really felt self-confident and uh so it was a big step and what was the country that that you served in again uh, i did six different countries so i was in nicaragua honduras costa rica ecuador dominican republic guatemala uh, did lots of them, and it was all different cultures, very different places, but all very rural, all very rugged. Did you visit multiple countries on uh, the same trip, or was each each one a different country? Each each time I do something different. So it would, usually the stints lasted anywhere from four weeks to three months. The longer I was in the program, the higher I went into the kind of the the rankings of staff and things like that. So by the end, I was spending at least three, even four months in my last year in Dominican Republic, where I'd spend time down there. So it seems like that was kind of a watershed moment for you. Is that a fair characterization? Oh, it was huge. It changed my life. That was, I, would, I don't think I would have ever gone to medicine had I not done that. And I don't know, to have, to have discovered purpose and uh, the belief that I could do something, the self-confidence, uh, self-reliance, all that sort of stuff in high school years was huge. And I think, I, I, I wish most kids in high school had that kind of opportunity where they could sink their teeth into something and, and start to get a, a vision for themselves later in life because I think that's hard to do in high school. You get caught up in just high school stuff that doesn't seem very important because it really isn't. Yeah, you know? absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So um, you, you went down to this program several years and would you say that um, within the first year you kind of had an idea, okay, maybe I, I might want to get into medicine or was it uh, maybe two or three times in that you kind of had that, that feeling? No, the first, first year I came back just wowed by the whole experience, really wanting to go back and became something I thought about pretty much all year long about where I go, what I might do, getting better at my Spanish skills, learning more about public health, that sort of a thing. Medicine seemed like a kind of a long shot, honestly. I wasn't terribly academic in high school, uh, so I wasn't, I had no idea what it would really take to get into medical school and whether or not I had what it took. Cause we all know it's hard to get into medical school and that sort of thing. So it was, it was a glimmer even after the first year. It was a glimmer, but I, I would say it got set into place after my second year. I really was convinced that's what I wanted to do. Is it fair to say you were a bit of a class clown uh, during high school years? Yeah, I, I, I majored in clowning around and getting by and 
doing the bare minimum and shooting for exactly a 3.0. I didn't want anything higher or lower, just, just enough to get by. And yeah, high school was not challenging, certainly. And yeah, I had, a, I had a good time in high school, but it wasn't always academic, no. <laughs> so this kind of led you to, okay, this is what I need to do to get into medical school. And so you moved in that direction. Then, then what was the next step? Um, uh, when did you kind of know, okay, I, I have the grades I need, I'm, I'm gonna go in that direction. And, and uh, where, where did you end up going to medical school? Went to uh, Chicago Medical School. So I went, graduated from Cal Poly and only got accepted to one medical school, but one's all it took. And so I went to Chicago for four years. So California to Chicago must have been a bit of a shock. Oh, a huge shock. I, it was a huge shock. I had no idea Chicago could be so different. We're both in the United States, going from Santa Barbara, particularly growing up in Santa Barbara. You know, L.A. Basin was different, but Chicago, just a, a way different place. The, the culture, the, the ethnicity, the divides, the, the attitudes, just a really different place. And not mention freezing your, your And freezing, off. yes. I had, no, <laughs> I had no idea about what ice really looks like and how you can really freeze a car to death. I mean, the, that your radio car, the radio tires can become kind of square and, and drive like this when you're going down the road until they warm up and stuff like that. It was a crazy place. So what, what was medical school like for you? Uh, did you find that it was just the hardest thing you'd ever done? I was, I was scared to death I wouldn't pass. I still had, I didn't have a lot of confidence in myself academically until after the first year of medical school. So I would thought, I mean, I was sitting down to people who had PhDs and masters from Harvard and all these places, and I just have a BS in biology from Cal Poly. I thought, I don't know if I'm going to make the cut here. So, so the first year I lived with a lot of fear, just wondering if I'd actually survive the first year. Um, after that, you know, then I got much more comfortable, actually got a little, little bit cocky as I've got through the last part of medical school knowing I could do fine. But, but the inner city, long hours, that, that did get to me. I, I didn't do well with the inner city thing. And by inner city thing, you mean were you, um, were you actually getting involvement with hospitals in the inner city or was it living in the inner city that was? In the hospitals. Cook County Hospital where I did a lot of my training is kind of the, the classic urban rundown a uh, hospital with lots of gangs and prostitutes and drug addicts and just a lot of stuff that I was not accustomed to and a lot of just uh, overwhelming feeling that you can't do enough. So I had, I had a vision for myself initially thinking I could actually serve there, but I realized after a year of working in the hospital there that I, that's not where I could be. I couldn't do that. And for those who don't know, what kind of hours are we talking about during those years? Back before they changed the laws and all the regulations as far as medical students, I would put in anywhere between 90 to 110 hours a week on the third and fourth year of medical school. So those long hours, long, long hours. As an understatement, oh, yeah. I mean, that's that a great way to burn out. It really was. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Just, I mean, it seems like it really takes a certain type of a person to even be able to get through that. Um, did you find a, like a new level and reach a new plateau to just kind of persevere through those times? At times, I just persevered. I wouldn't say that it was a. You, 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 the, the prospect of quitting is part of what kept me going. Sometimes, I couldn't think. I couldn't see quitting after having come so far. Had it been easy to do something else, it would have been pretty easy to say, "This is torture. I'm done with this. Let me out of here." But the idea that I've come, you know, eight, you know, whatever, five years to get there, to quit after another couple of years in medical school, just. That was too bleak. So I think of just persevering sometimes. It wasn't always a good, good thing. So you, you did persevere. You got through. You graduated. And am I correct to say you were very near the top of your class? Oh, this is my <laughs> opportunity to brag. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So yes, I graduated seventh in my class, and I scored in the 98th percentile on the national board. So I did really well academically. Uh -huh. So. So you go from this high school kid who doesn't really have a lot of purpose and confidence through this program, get your um, BS biology, go to medical school. Huge transformation, it seems like, all the way through there. Oh, yeah. It was to get to medical school and work really hard and then find out that I really did have the smarts and the ability and the perseverance and all those attributes that you need to get through and do well. 
Oh yeah, it was, again, very rewarding. I didn't have a lot of confidence going in, and so to come out of it feeling much more confident, again, it was another, another turning point, I think, that way. So you are someone who would be in demand, I would think, after scoring that well. So you, you then, what's the next step after you finish medical school? Well, then you go through the process of deciding what specialty you want to go into, and then they have a, it's called a residency match, where they, you try to choose a, a residency and they choose you. And then you have the choice of what residency you think you would get accepted to. And I was encouraged by my, my counselor in medical school to go to really competitive residencies like orthopedic surgery or some specialized cardiovascular surgery or something that would be something I could do because of my grades and that sort of thing. But it wasn't really, that wasn't where my heart was. And that was a bit of a struggle because in academic medicine to it appeals to you to want to do those things which are more sought after and that are more uh, prestigious, I'd say. So being, being a family practitioner is not pre as prestigious as being another specialty. So for me to go into family practice, which is really where my heart was, um, pediatrics or family practice, kind of went against what my counselor thought I would. I, he says, why would you do that when you can do this? Why would you do family practice? You can get into a much better residency. And I said, well, that's not what I want. So it was, it was an interesting time to kind of insist on or believe in what my heart was telling me rather than what my head was trying to tell me. And why was your heart telling you to go into family practice? I think it's my nature. My nature is to enjoy relationship with people, to uh, see the care of patient through a continuum of over time. I think I wanted to be in a small town. I, I think it's my nature. I think that's. I think family practice is where I was best suited. I think. I think it was a really good fit. I'm really glad I did it. It's neat that you knew that about yourself at that moment and insisted on it, even kind of going against what your counsel was telling you. That's that seems like it, it's a little bit of a, a rarity too that you had that clarity. I'm a little surprised I did too, actually, because I don't. I don't know exactly why I was so clear on that, but it, it really felt clear at the moment, at that time. Now, where did your wife come in during this picture? When, when did you meet her and then... Um... I met her my, in my fourth year of medical school. I was doing a rotation at Stanford, and we have a famous story, which I can't do the half hour here, because I could do that here, but we met on a bus, and it was a really fun adventure, and we ended up then writing letters to each other for several months. And then I flew her out to Chicago and we drove across country and and it was a great great way to meet, great way to get to know each other. Um, the internship we were was pretty rough on our relationship, but we survived it. I wouldn't say we flourished, but we survived it. And uh, got married in my uh, third year of residency. So they say a road trip can make or break a relationship, right? Mm -hmm. So you got to experience that early on. That's oh, cool. It was a great adventure, yeah. It was a good one. Very yeah. cool. Um, once, once you were ready to choose where you wanted to put some roots down, uh, w were you in uh, Southern California at that time when you were ready to make that decision? I was in Long Beach for my residency, yeah. So I spent three years down there, and uh, we knew we didn't, we didn't want to live in the city. We knew that. Beyond that, we weren't sure where we wanted to be, so we started with the western United States, and it shrunk pretty fast to California. And then we started looking at Lake Tahoe, and everywhere on the western slope from Mariposa up to, to Auburn, that kind of an area, and then the central coast, Santa Barbara, those areas. And then we came down to Murphy's. Did you have quite a few options that were promising that you could have kind of gone different spots? Oh, yeah. It was actually fun. I wrote 100 letters by hand back when we had typewriters and sent them out, and I think we got 15 or 20 responses from people uh, all willing to have me join them. We filtered through those and then looked at probably six different offers seriously and then came down to Murphy's because we love Murphy's. It's great. Why, why small town? Why rural? What made you go that way? Really sick of city life. I didn't like, there's nothing appealing about the city except for ethnic food. That's the only thing I can think of I liked about, you know, we thought we'd come up here and still go to San Francisco once a month to get ethnic food, but that didn't happen. So I love the outdoors, I love the mountains, I love 
uh, some serenity. I love the feel of a small town. Uh, there's just traffic, noise, congestion, pressure, everything in the city. I just, I was, we were both ready to escape. Now, Santa Barbara, I don't, I don't think of that as a small town, but did you say you were up in Solvang for a while? Or yeah. Was that, is, did that have a small town feel? Oh, yeah. So that's where you kind of had the experience of this is one, this is another, I like this. Right. And some people, they don't, they don't like the small town feel because they feel they don't have enough anonymity, and so you can't escape, you know, from being known and seen and known about and all that sort of stuff. But, it's, but there's also a, a closeness and a support and a other feelings you get in a small town you can't get in a city. We lived in Long Beach for three years, and we had neighbors that I've met once, and the other ones we'd wave to, they, they ignore us on the way out to their driveway, and we live literally 10 feet away. It's a very different experience in the city. Well, that's probably because you're not a friendly person, right? Because that's right. I, I, didn't, I didn't try hard enough. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's all about noisy parties I had. I don't know. Yeah, that, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, where, does, where does Emily fit into the picture? Where does Emily fit into the picture? Yes. I mean, when was she born here? She was born here? In, in, San, in Calaveras in, in San Andreas. Okay. We had moved here in July. She was born in September. So came up here pregnant and loaded uh, down with a truck. And Wow. Kim loved the experience of driving up here in July in the heat, being pregnant. It was wonderful. Welcome yeah. to Calaveras, Welcome right? Calaveras. <laughs> oh, I'm miserable. It's hot. <laughs> What was it like settling in to this completely new place and, and... Exciting and scary. Nobody else in my residency did anything remotely similar. Most of all of them joined some big group with the guaranteed salary and all that sort of stuff. So uh, to j come here and kind of know that uh, I kind of had to make it or break it. I joined two other doctors, so it wasn't like it was coming up and just hanging up a shingle. But even so, it was a, kind of a risk. I had a big medical school loan. Uh, it was not going to be, you know, financially as as nice as some of the packages that was, would have been offered in the city, that sort of thing. But a little scary, but pretty exciting too. Especially Kim being so excited at the same time, that we were both really on board with it, and being excited to be close to the mountains and Yosemite, and and looking forward to raising a family here. Yeah, that was good. How how many months or years after you moved to Calaveras? Did you kind of have a piece about that being the right decision? I think it was, I don't think I ever looked back. Okay. I think it was pretty much immediate. It was, there was nothing, there was no major setback that I thought, oh, I can't, that might have been a wrong decision. So I, I don't think I ever looked back. I was always looking forward. And what has it been like to raise a family, or what was it like to raise a family in Calaveras? Oh, great. I mean, I, I love the community. I love the support network of friends we've had. I love... The experience I've been able to have with my kids and, and Kim. I mean, all the traveling we've done in the mountains and the hiking and the climbing and the, uh, all the basic things, going to the creek, uh, watching the birds, finding wildflowers, uh, all those times of walking around with kids in the backpack. And I think, what do, they, what do they learn and what do they come away with that they may not have gotten in the city? So I know they wouldn't have gotten in the city. Yeah, very, very unique opportunities up here for sure. And as a, as a doctor, as a family doctor, did you see your practice just grow and grow and grow? It would, it, yeah, it happened very quickly, and it was entirely surprising how fast it grew, and I, I never had any issues with having enough patients, and I've been blessed with a full practice virtually forever, so it's, it's been very gratifying. Yeah, very gratifying. In your mind, as a, a family doctor, what, what kind of an experience do you want to provide to your patients so when they walk out your door, you, you feel that you've really done the best job that you can? What, what are those important components? Uh, paying attention. That's become a kind of a new buzzword and a new reality for me because I don't always see that elsewhere. And I think that's part of what I realize that I, I'm, is important to me, and I hope I do well with it. I think I do. But that's when a patient coming in, just paying attention to what it is that they are trying to convey to you, communicate, paying attention to the things you see as they're speaking. If I notice things about their body or the way they get on and off a table, the way they're walking, the way they're talking, it's, a, it's paying attention. It's noticing those things. And it's, it's, it's amazing how many times a little clue like that from just paying attention changes the whole outcome of the office visit. Um, 
listening, adding humor. I love having humor in the office. I mean, it's it's it makes people comfortable. It's all about relationship, uh, and that's part of that. You know, it doesn't always have to be a serious, sterile encounter. People and myself, I I feel better. I enjoy it. So if I enjoy the visit, they enjoy the visit. Uh, it's a it's more than just practicing medicine. What What's one of the more challenging parts of the job that you've experienced over the years? Part of it can be in a small town working and, and treating people that you know when bad things either might happen or do happen. Sometimes I have to live with the fear of things that might happen, even if they don't. Uh, the... It can. It's, it, it takes a toll on me emotionally sometimes when I lose people. Bad things happen to people that I care about, from that I've been taking care of for years and years. Um, sometimes the feeling somewhat isolated up here from specialists and that sort of thing can be that can be a problem too. Um, so I'd say those are the biggest challenges. Speaking of that, feeling isolated, another big part of what you've done in this community is start the Mind Matters uh, Clinic. And can you talk a little bit about how that came to be? Well, we have a son named Mitch, who you know well. So, and Mitchell was ended up being diagnosed autistic, but it took till age 11. And we'd gone through a long process of trying to find services for him. And in doing that, I became more and more educated about autism, about ADHD, things that he struggled with. And then I tried to get those services to come here. Uh, and Kim started working with kids at Christian Family Learning Center, developed a whole dyslexia remediation program there for kids with learning disabilities, taught kids social skills. So we learned all these things. Between the two of us, we started saying, okay, how do we, how do we make something like this happen? And we tried for a couple of years to make something happen outside of what we ended up doing, which was Mind Matters, and then finally just took the plunge and invented something that we didn't know if it would fly or not. So you, you literally opened up a, a place locally where people who were going through things like what you were going through could come and get the help they needed without driving. I mean, how far would you have to go? Sacramento? Sacramento would be closest. And even then, there, there, there weren't a lot of places where you could get more than one service in one place. Uh, the Mind Institute was just coming about at that point, and even now you can't really go there for all the services. So there's still... There's still a lack of places where you can go. I have a, if you go with a child with autism, you, see, you imagine going to one place and get medical care here, you get psychological care here, you get social skills training here, you might get something else somewhere else, but they don't coordinate the care. And that's still, still a virtue of what we do and makes us unique. Is that something that could be used as a model in, in other areas, or have you seen that model take off in other areas? I've seen a few similar things elsewhere, but I haven't seen as many as I'd like. So I'd love somebody to steal the idea and use it elsewhere. I'd love people talked about franchising what we do, which that'd be great if somebody could do it. But that's being a nonprofit, though. I don't know if that's that'd be very motivating for some people because you have to keep raising money. It doesn't pay for itself well. Has the community supported the effort that you and Kim started? Oh yeah, it's been amazing actually. It's after nine years of doing it and we're still financially doing well and it will provide at least at least 60% of our services are based on grants and donations. That's, that's huge. That's huge for a small community like this. Amazing. How has having a son, um, having Mitch, how has that changed you? Ooh, that's a big one. Changed me a lot of ways, professionally and personally, as a family. Uh, it's been a big learning curve for me about how his autism impacts not just him, but the rest of the family, how it interacts with the community, the siblings. I mean, Jared and Emily, how it impacted them. And then just for me professionally, there, there was a bit of, it's hard as a physician not to be able to fix a problem, not be able to do more. You know, autism is, it's treatable, but not, not typically curable. So learning, coming to terms with the fact that I'm powerless over it in ways. And that was, 
it's been an interesting process. It, and then because of that, learning how to use that as a potentially as something that's a blessing to others by being able to be a blessing to others, to have a similar experience. I mean, it's really a lot of credibility when I to, talk to other families and say, I know what you're feeling because I know what you're feeling because I've done it. I've been there. So it's not just me parroting something I've read from a book. I can speak from the heart, and that always makes a difference. You've done so much in this community. You've given back so much to this community. But it's getting toward that time in your life when you may be looking to make a transition, potentially into retirement at some point. Looking toward the future, what are some things that you'd like to do You know, in the, the next 20, 30 years? Climb every mountain in California, and then go to Colorado and climb over there. No. Um, I continue to enjoy the outdoors. I continue to enjoy gardening, work around the house, and I can enjoy, continue to enjoy the, the relationships I have with people. And so, at retirement, it's going to be a challenge for me. As much as I, I would, I can see the time when I don't want to work as hard. It would be hard for me to stop doing what I'm doing because it is gratifying. You wouldn't want to, at some point, be a grandfather. Would oh you? no, heavens no! Why would I want to do that? <laughs> no, have a grandchild and like be able to give permission to be silly and stupid and and have a reason to do it. Yeah, I'd love that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I'm not taking that as any pressure. Okay, no pressure. No, no pressure. pressure whatsoever. No pressure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I personally, you know, I, I thank you for all that you've done for this community, and I know that there are you know thousands of people out there who also thank you for what you've done, and I hope that 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 transition. Uh, from what you're doing now to the future goes really smoothly for you. And I have a feeling that knowing you, no matter what comes your way, you're always going to stay busy and you're always going to be doing things that you love. So I, I hope that, that the, the next years just turn out to be fantastic. Thanks. And I appreciate that you took the time to, to come on and kind of tell your life story for us. So thank you. Thanks for having me, Joel. And thank you for joining me on this edition of Inside View. I'm your host, Joel Metzger. And I hope you join me next time.